Yeah, there we are. Well, it's great to be back for, uh, I can't even remember how many times. And uh, always enjoy. Of course, it's a little better if it's springtime. <clears throat> but we've had a little bit of that, so. Um, yeah, you're probably wondering about this photo. Um, first thing you're wondering, is it real? But uh, I spent... <laughs> No, the creator is sitting right out there. Uh, I spent an awful lot of time, about 40 years, investigating cases where UFOs landed and uh, left behind physical evidence of one kind or another. And then I was called uh, one afternoon about 10 years ago by a property owner at uh, what we now call the Marley Woods. and. He had had some unusual sightings, and his neighbors also had had odd sightings. And they asked me if I would come down and do some investigating and explain it. And I said, well, probably not the explaining part, but I'll sure come down and look. So 10 years later, I'm still trying to explain it. And uh, not really. I'm, I'm, I want to get more knowledge about what and how uh, what the stuff is and how it's going on and uh, not quite bright enough we don't have quite enough data to uh, to come up with any real answers uh, we have seen some interesting patterns developing uh, and in the past uh, six months or so uh, new things have been happening which seem to directly uh, correlate with the Skinwalker Ranch in Utah and um, that's something I've had in mind when I first read Skinwalker a year ago. And uh, it's just a pretty interesting, amazing uh, comparison. So after 10 years, uh, I can give you a few facts and figures on what's happening over there. And uh, I won't belabor this. The first known event in the Marley Woods area was in 1937. There are various classes, types of objects seen, displays, observed. What we call the ambers, and I'll be showing you examples of all of these. Of the ambers, we have 302 known events. Small light balls ranging from the size of a baseball to a basketball. 186 plus events. What we call the mystery lights, which are uh, two objects. One that appears consistently at exactly the same spot in the north and the other in the south. We have what we call the light mass, which is a large object that appears suddenly on the ground and is visible at a point about eight-tenths of a mile from where our usual vantage point. And the event's uh, duration lasts from an hour to an hour and 30 minutes, so plenty of time to photograph it and observe it. And as we're trying to do now, get much closer. We've had physical trace cases, 31 in the Marley. We've had 16 structured objects reported. And a fascinating class is the unseen fours. Uh, we've had six of those reported. Unusual horse and cattle deaths, 22. And most of those in the very recent, uh, in recent days. And a large unknown animal, 13 events. Um, when I began all this, I didn't actually think I would ever get to a point where I was chasing large, white, hairy animals. But uh, it's kind of fun, really. <laughs> but I'll show you what we've got so far. You can make up your own uh, minds uh, is what we're looking at. This, uh, <laughs> this unsuspecting guy on the uh, ATV is the caretaker of what we call Site 1. And uh, uh, 
we have trail cameras set up in various areas there, and it captured uh, the caretaker, but unfortunately the big animal wasn't there. Okay, observations of amber displays. <clears throat> On October the 17th of last year, a lady is driving to visit friends, and this is a very remote area, a lot of small gravel and dirt roads. And as she's driving along, she makes the wrong turn, turns down a very narrow dirt gravel lane, and as uh, she reaches a dead end, of course, uh, she's having a devil of a time turning the car around because there are ditches on each side and the road is narrow. And uh, it's late at night, she's by herself. And uh, what she really needs is suddenly for about 20 of these things to appear right in front of her. And these, uh, we call the ambers, and they're quite large. Um, they are seen from a single object to two objects side by side or above each other, up to 20, 30, even 40 of these large displays in various patterns and changing patterns. Uh, sometimes the sightings are a few seconds to uh, several minutes. And they are tremendously bright. However, they are not bright to look at. I can't really explain that statement, but um, as I mean, they're strikingly bright. Um, but when you look at them visually, they have a, a very mellow orange, amberish color. And I was able to see five of those. My first sighting, after 44 years of research, my first sighting of something I couldn't explain was at Marley, and uh, that was on my seventh trip over there. And the five objects were the large ambers, and three came on in a row. One comes on, and another comes on to the east. And what is totally amazing is the sky was still brightly lit. There are no wings, no engines, no means of support, no parachutes. Uh, no flares going off, and you're staying there looking at these silent, stationary things that just can't be there. And <clears throat> that began uh, a change in my outlook on some of this phenomena. And it's been pretty profound for me. <clears throat> for years, many years, you know, I was the nuts and bolts guy. And after seeing some of this stuff, it's cut a little shorter to just the nuts guy. <laughs> I do believe UFOs are solid objects with mass because we were able to determine weights of 7 to 14 tons at landing sites uh, from the landing imprints and so on. So I have no, uh, no doubt that they are solid physical objects at some point in the observations are in their being visible. And I also believe that something maybe as simple as a change in frequency uh, brings them to another point. And uh, so the more of this stuff that we see personally, um, I honestly got a little tired of always being after the fact. Uh, people would have a very good UFO landing, it would finally get around, it would finally get to us, and a month's gone by, and you go in and you can see what it did to the ground, but you're four weeks behind the object. And so we, uh, a small group of us, which we call the SIU now, um, decided a couple of years ago that perhaps the best approach would be not to go in after the fact, but during activity. And this was the perfect spot to do it. So we are now uh, active and we're about, we're very close to being able to be there 24 seven. And we have some monitoring equipment working over there right now. So we'll be getting better data, more data, better equipment and uh, hopefully move ahead and understand a bit of this stuff. 
Now, on May the 3rd of last year, uh, the team was there, Adam Johnson and his two brothers, and uh, they were able to see and videotape seven of the Ambers, and uh, just coming in a random pattern. This is the first one, and there's no color because it was on night vision. There are two of the objects. And this is a digital still of, the, uh, of one of the ambers. And it's, quite frankly, the best photo I've seen of the ambers. And that's the second. Now, imagine if you were looking at 30 of these in the air. It's a pretty astonishing sight. Now, to the light mass. On the 12th of December last year, uh, one of the SIU guys, Tom Ferrario and I, and the property owner, suddenly spotted this brilliant light to the south. And I had sort of forgotten that I had seen this five other occasions in, in the past. And after we watched it for two or three minutes, we started videotaping. And this thing was uh, visible for an hour and 23 minutes. And that was a still taken from, uh, from the video. This is the actual uh, location of the object. And uh, right behind the area I've denoted as the white area, you'll see two tree trunks that come up. And later, uh, you'll see this in a uh, telephoto shot I made in 1999. Now, this, these are stills from the video, and this is coming from the faintest stage to the brightest, all on the same scale. And this is where it gets really interesting. The what we call the central artifact is visible there. The color is different, and it seems to have some sort of uh, actual shape, and perhaps even a bit of structure to it. Um, that appeared on five of the uh, one thirtieth of a second frames on the video. And uh, obviously, we want a much closer look at that. Now. What I'd like to do, I'd like to call Tom Ferrario up to uh, describe, because I don't want you to think I'm the only one seeing this stuff, um, the events that took place while we were on this uh, hour and 20 minute episode. Come on up, Tom. Yeah, it was, as Ted was speaking about, this is quite unique. And this is one of the few places that we've inserted ourselves in the head actual what we like to call a contact with this and uh the unique thing about the object was that this thing the luminosity of this thing just pulsed so large at times and as the artifact like ted describes it actually seemed to have structure and uh one of the things I, i'll let ted maybe go into later in more detail that uh we actually went to the site and the property owner was at our vantage point, remained at that vantage point. So we tried after 20 minutes, we thought, well, we can maybe get to this artifact. So we went out in chase of this artifact. And one of the interesting things about this was that when we got to the site of the artifact, and this led us to have a conclusion, have a really mind bending thing that this thing is actually, we really feel now directional because when we were in close proximity, the property owner had our taillights in view. We were just a couple hundred yards from the artifact. He also had the object in view. It never changed in location and pulse and size a little bit. He was able to see our taillights and we were not able to view this structure and light any artifacts of the light from this object at all. So it's, sort of like we described tunnel vision at that point. 
that we, the property owner, could see it from one specific point at this, and uh, which was really a unique experience because that that taught us so much at that time. And uh, one of the other experiences that Ted and I have had directly with this object, and uh, and this is such a departure from so many places we go and put ourselves into, is that this, we actually feel that this thing exhibits intelligence and reacts to us because at one point we were leaving this site and the cab of the truck lit up, illuminated, and we it was like a, a truck with dual headlights came on behind us. And uh, similar to the, I might just, you know, it was similar to the scene in Close Encounters. And, uh, but this thing illuminated our whole truck of the cab of the truck. And uh, we slammed on the brakes, got it jumped out of the vehicle, and it just dis extinguished like that. And uh, we did, could not see the light source at that time. So it's, it was quite an experience, one of the few I've had in the field personally. And, uh, but it all centers around this artifact. And that's... Uh, a little bit, and then we might go into let Adam go into some of the other. Yeah, yeah. Let me wind this see, thing. But, uh, <clears throat> okay, thank you, Tom. Okay. Uh, so I'm not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> not? <laughs> well, I didn't want to go that far. <laughs> this is a closer upper of the uh, of this central thing, and this, believe me, is very intriguing. And we're going to have uh, these particular images enhanced uh, beyond what we can do and see what's going on. And one individual, well, actually two, looking at uh, these images, uh, the first thing he said was, well, is this like looking into a tunnel? And uh, that makes my hair kind of stand up, as it usually does anyway. But... Uh, because five years ago, if you'd have mentioned a portal to me, I would have, well, I wouldn't have been nasty about it, but I wouldn't have paid a lot of attention. And this whole business over there, the more I see, uh, it really brings it home. When you personally can see it and listen to all these credible people you'd believe about anything else uh, reporting this stuff, um, you have to change with what you're seeing. And I base all my uh, beliefs, if you can call them that, on the data, not on things that, that I believe. Now, this photo I took in 1999 of this same device, whatever. Um, and I shot this with 35 millimeter camera, 300 millimeter telephoto lens. And the really interesting thing about this is, if you notice, Behind the bright central light, there is a sort of dome that's illuminated with this yellowish and orange light. And it's almost like they're little cells in this, which are individual oblong lights. And I can tell you, and there you see silhouetted in front of it those two trees that I mentioned in the other photo. So we know exactly where it's at. And, uh, and not only that, we had the bearings on it, and we did a lot of footwork over there. And uh, it's so interesting because you, the trees are in a very thin band of trees along a fence line. Then behind that is a sloping fence or field, and it slopes up high enough that it could not be a light source from beyond that field. And it's obviously sitting down uh, just behind those those trees. So behind it, there is simply a uh, an elevated flat field, and uh, and no way to get in there. I mean, this thing, the trees around this area, you couldn't even get a a motorcycle, small sickle, no, certainly not an ATV in there. Uh, so whatever it is, it's real interesting and. Uh, the possibility for a lot of research with it uh, is very great because it does appear again and again. And we now have uh, CCD cameras in a position where they can monitor this. There's a deer stand just in the woods 
what would, which would put you uh, about 100 feet from this thing were it to appear. And that's one of Tom's favorite hangouts is that deer stand. Not quite sure, but why? But uh, at any rate, uh, just another fascinating piece of the puzzle. Now, there are two other areas we've learned of just outside of the Marley Woods where there is very intense activity. This particular site, uh, and of course it would have to be a cemetery, but there have been many, many observations of the small white light balls and very large white objects. Uh, in one event, the guy's sitting out in front of this place on a little gravel road, and he's talking on his telephone, uh, cell phone, and all of a sudden, the signal is just going crazy. He looks up, and there's a, uh, a large circular white object just above the ground, uh, about 300 feet in front of him. And he thought, boy, this is something. And then two more came on, and it was really, boy, this is something. And he wound up with four of the objects right in front of him in a horizontal line. And the interesting thing about all this stuff, it does not illuminate anything in front of it, below it, or around it. Absolutely a self-contained light. And even as they're moving along three feet above the ground, there's no illumination of the ground or the nearby trees. Uh, we've had the light balls fly over the backs of a herd of cattle. No reaction from the cattle at all, and they, they presented no illumination on the animals. This is yet another um, new site that we've learned of, and the little white uh, balls indicate uh, the first sighting that we obtained from there. Uh, a small headlight-sized light ball was seen by three people sitting inside a church after services, and they see the object near the ground, and it's stationary at this point in the, uh, in the cemetery. And suddenly it goes vertical about six feet, six feet to, the, uh, to this side, six foot to this side, back to the middle, down, and keeps repeating this pattern. And we've had lots of reports in Marley of white objects, and the witnesses described their motion as like a yo-yo, up and down, so forth. And um, I was talking the other day to uh, probably the leading visual effects expert experts in this country, or the world, <laughs> and we'd been talking about these things, and I came to the yo-yo thing, and he uh, is very, very interested because he says the, uh, the very latest technology has presented uh, the government with a project where instead of using uh, stereo vision in a ranging or survey object or satellite or device, if you use a single lens object and do the up and down ranging, you get the most accurate presentation of whatever you're trying to survey. So he's very interested in that. Structured objects, uh, we've not had a lot of those. We do have some daylight video of two structured objects, which were flying along a nice bright blue sky, uh, 16 witnesses, and several of them had video cameras. One guy was really quick, he got it, and the two objects are flying along like this. And all of a sudden, the lower object, without slowing or stopping, reverses and heads in a uh, uh, almost vertical ascent and disappears in the opposite direction. We've had instances where a uh, very large object the size of a football field um, blocks out the stars. It's long, it's a uh, cylinder, and the entire underneath uh, has countless small white lights. And they were able to obtain video. It does not show the uh, silhouette of the object, but all the little white lights that indicates its shape. And what was really cool was this thing was flying east to west, no sound, passed right over the witnesses, 
And <clears throat> as it just reached a point to the west, it suddenly divided, and half of the object flew away to the south, and the other continued on to the west. <clears throat> and there were four additional witnesses to the splitting, and that object uh, going south flew right over those four people. Now this was an event in which two people saw two bright objects in the sky, and they uh, put binoculars on them and could see that they were saucer-shaped, and each had a dome, and in that dome were multicolored lights, and the dome seemed to be rotating at a very high rate of speed. And the two objects were one above the other, and they were identical. Well, as they're watching these things for about 10 minutes, suddenly to the north they see uh, a bright object coming from the northern horizon. And it's traveling so slow it takes 25 minutes to reach the point where these two saucer objects are. And as it reached the two, it suddenly turned into two saucer-type objects. And instantly, uh, they had a sort of square with each of the saucers at each point of the square. Then, as they watch, the four objects suddenly merge into one very bright object. Then they separate again. And as they're hanging there as four objects, as you see over to the right, there developed a faint curtain of light, which seemed to connect the upper two and the lower two. Then they merged again into one very bright uh, cent uh, central object, which developed what looked like a tail. And the tail would separate from the object, go down to the ground, remain there for a few seconds, go back up, rejoin, and it repeated this process several times. And uh, these are extremely credible people. That's their sketch. And as you can see, we use only the best sketch paper. <laughs> Have to keep that scientific look at all costs. They did manage to take some photos. Unfortunately, they're not very good. They do show there were two uh, bright objects there. And as all the activity was going on, then they were presented with, uh, with several different types of lights. Now, the mystery light, 186 known uh, events. The mystery light appears at the spot indicated, precisely that spot. I uh, put a very high-powered astronomical telescope on that spot, and you lock everything down. The next time it appears, that's where it's at. And this telescope, believe me, has an extremely narrow field of view. So number one, that's kind of interesting. And as the property owners continue to watch this thing, there's no real pattern. Uh, sometimes it uh, will appear seven nights in a row at varying times. Sometimes it will appear and not appear again for two months, three months, seven months, and then a grouping of, uh, of events. And it does different things, but primarily it just sits there and if, if any of you are familiar at all with Skinwalker, there was an event where the, and the first time I read it, instantly I thought about this light. Uh, the owner of the Skinwalker property uh, would go out in the evening and there was a particular tree stump and he would take his rifle with a scope on it, put his elbow and the rifle and the scope on this thing, and it would be in the same spot uh, exactly. And this is what the North Mystery Light at Marley looks like. And right there, just below the base of it, as a matter of fact, it's kind of in the treetops right there. Uh, based on triangulation, we've pretty well determined this thing is probably three quarters of a mile, no more, and perhaps a bit less. So you can imagine one of her plans, or my plans, is to send Tom and Adam out into the woods <laughs> as, bait. as bait and to get a better view, yeah. <laughs> now, I mean, I would do it, you know, but uh, 
So at any rate, in the Skinwalker deal, when he's looking at something described just like this, he could see on occasion inside the lighter area what appeared to be a blue sky, clouds, treetops, and he said it was like he was looking into another world. And this went on and on and on, countless times. So, I don't know what to tell you. It's, it's really fascinating stuff. And sometimes, now, this is the mystery light ascending. And what it can do, it has been seen for a few seconds to 15 plus minutes. And what it sometimes will do is come up from that stationary position, arc a little bit to the east, as it's doing here, and slowly move up, no sound, no other lights, from due north to due east, and just wink out. There's an old barn, barn to the east, and it happens right over that. Well, what really gets fascinating is the south mystery light is sort of like this, and it's sometimes seen for several evenings in a row, same spot. It also, on occasions, will rise remain stationary three, four, five minutes, climbs more bright and enlarge, and the owners have actually seen it as large as the full moon to the eye, and they know that because the full moon was rising, so they had it for a comparison. And uh, what really gets curious, on many nights, the south mystery light will appear, go through all this stuff, and move clear over the old east barn, disappear, and instantly the north light appears, and it will move eventually over to the old barn and disappear. So, whatever it is, there's some real interesting stuff going on there. And I'm sure Tom and Adam will be able to get in there and get a good look at it. Now, I took these shots. This is the south mystery light. And this, I watched this thing for about four minutes at about this position, no movement at all. And it got brighter and brighter and brighter. And uh, uh, I finally determined this is something odd. So I grabbed the camera and I shot this photo and a bunch of other photos. And this was as it was climbing higher. And that's an enlargement of it. It was perfectly circular. This unusual amber color, no sound. And as I watched this thing, it flew right over me, silently. And at the point where it was overhead, you could no longer see the very bright orange area, directional perhaps. And what you could see were two light gray, faint gray, circular areas, side by side with a little spacing between them. No other lights, no sound, nothing. And it flew on, and just as he passed the overhead point, it vanished. So, cool stuff, I tell you. It's like uh, heaven sent, this stuff. Now, the light ball observations, that's my very favorite in Marley. Well, up until the gigantic white animal. Um, just about five weeks ago, the, uh, one of the Site 2 property owners was walking out to the mailbox. And as you can see in the distance, there's a large lake that's been created there uh, over the last year or so. And over the lake, she saw not a small but a large white light ball. And it was just kind of playing around, as they tend to do. And no particular motion. And then it starts moving directly toward the witness. And it was, she said, not more than two, maybe three feet off the ground. No changes in brightness, size, or anything. And it reached this point just across the gravel road, about uh, 40 feet from her. And of course, she had a very good look at it, but all she could see was it was circular and brilliant white. And uh, the thing went vertical, and in, she said, two seconds, it was gone. So 
I hate to put it this way, but it's typical stuff for the Marley Woods. Now this is a photo taken from site two. This is a still from a video. This light ball was uh, very close to the camera and perhaps the size of a, ba a baseball. And you can see some vegetation there under it. And it's really cool to watch the video of the motion of this thing. Change, changes shape occasionally or is moving a little faster. This was a pretty cheap surveillance camera that he had set up. And the camera was about 30 feet above the ground uh, near some trees. And he's obtained some really, really good light ball images. Now, this is the crown jewel for us of uh, the light ball cases. Uh, as interested as I am in this particular uh, class of object, I had not been able to see it um, about, what was it, three weeks ago. I was at site one, it was about 11 o'clock at night, and I walked out of the cabin, the old cabin, and walked to the west of it. There are just tiny areas where you can get cell phone reception. And this was the good area for reception. I'm talking on the phone, and suddenly about 30, 40 feet this way, two light balls about the size of an automobile headlight, not nearly as bright, perfectly circular, not pure white, but a sort of tinge of pale yellow, and uh, actually, they look like uh, uh, the really old 1930s sort of automobile headlights. And they're side by side. They maintain the same position relative to each other. And they're gliding along just, you, you have the impression of on ice, so smooth. And they bob and weave around tree trunks. And the really neat thing was, as I'm watching these things and describing them over the phone, of course, I didn't have a camera, um, the wind is blowing 30 to 40 miles an hour out of the north, and they were flying right into it. Now, for a couple of objects this size to have the power to be able to do that raises your shackles a little bit. This particular case we learned of, a family of four, a lady, her husband, their 20 and 12 year old sons were down in this area, which of course is a cemetery. <laughs> that seems to be something that pops up quite frequently. Uh, and they're standing just beside this, uh, this building, this pole building. And all of a sudden an object comes into view, a single object, and to listen to the video is really good because you can hear the 12-year-old boy's reaction. And what's even funnier is the wife and husband. Uh, and this is a uh, still frame from the video. This is frame one. They shot 15 minutes of light ball video. At the close point, the light balls were 40 feet from the camera. And I had always envisioned the light balls as being sort of a solid ball of light. And uh, this video totally changes that concept. This thing flies around for a bit, the single object. It goes into a pendulum motion like this. It goes straight up, down, to the side, back, flies off uh, uh, camera view. About 30 seconds later, these come into view. And as you can see, there is a dynamic process going on in these two images. Colors, uh, some pretty distinct colors are seen. Now these are full frames, so you can imagine enlarged. Uh, the detail you can see. You can actually see structure in this cloudy material that uh, uh, is over what appears to be a bright, extremely bright bar of light at the center. Now 
Now at the top, you can see just a bit of the uh, extremely bright section of light. Now, after they watch this, the two objects fly over to the, uh, to the east, and they take up station about three feet above the ground by a, a cedar tree. And as you listen to the video, uh, they're describing what it's doing. And the husband's getting a little nervous because now it looks like sort of a long white dress. The two are connected. And they're just stationary and occasionally they sway and move a little bit. And this goes on and on and on. And as they're taping, uh, they move to the inside of this shelter. And they can hear sounds like something walking in the gravel right around the uh, base of this shelter building. And yet, they can't see anything. And there's enough ambient light that they could have seen something. And then they hear odd noises on this picnic table. And so they're inside trying to figure out what these sounds are. The 12-year-old boy is out in front of this building and he starts yelling, you know, come here, come here, look at this. And he's shooting cell phone photos, the best I've ever seen, of a blazing, intense, red, small light bulb, which is stationary over that far corner of this building and not two feet from it. Inside, before they step out, they're shooting video across the table and coming from just above the table up near the top of this building are moving wavy lines in two bands, one red and one blue. And that's the only point in the 15 minute video that these bands of light are visible. What just happens, this thing, which is extremely powerful, just looking at it, is emitting what? An electromagnetic field, who knows? But somehow it's being picked up by the video camera and they hear this sound again in, in the table. And they're standing out there looking at this. Well, finally, it flies over, it goes out, it joins the two that are by the tree, and it goes on for the full 15 minutes before they just disappear. And what I found when I finally got to talk to them at the site, I was very interested in this sound. You know, I said, well, what, what did it sound like? Well, I don't know. And so the, the father gets up on the picnic table, walks on it, no, jumps on it, no. And he got off of it. And I just had the thought and I got hold of it. And this is very heavy, very heavy table. And I scooted it an inch or two on the concrete. He said, that's it. And this was while the light waves and this red thing was right there. So you might theorize that it was emitting enough power that it actually either pushed or pulled the picnic table an inch or two uh, across the concrete floor. And we do know that small objects like that uh, have levitated automobiles, trucks, people, all kinds of things off a road or a field or whatever. I've got several hundred cases like that. So, uh, and then the story gets really good. Uh, these, these people, and it actually at one point, the young boy says on the video, on the audio, he says, something just ran across the ground. This would be the other side of this between it and the fence. And when I questioned him about it, I said, what was it? He said, it looked like a real big dog. And yet they never actually saw it, big dog. <laughs> uh, and uh, so at any rate, he had this really good, or these really good cell phone photos of especially the red object, and they had beautiful video of it. And um, they were not the most expert uh, folks at videography. And uh, so I was just constantly on them, you know, I've got to get a copy of this. And we were down at this site when we were talking about this. And she said, okay, we'll go up to the house, we'll, we'll make a copy. And uh, before we could get to the car, I noticed she was shooting video 
that night a round of the people there and everything. And I, I thought, please, no. And so we got up there and we started copying her original video. And just as it was coming to the park with the red light, it goes to that night's videotaping. So we got 15 minutes of it, but we didn't get all of it. And uh, I wish I could show you this red thing. It's astonishing. And I might point out the reason you're interested in small red lights at Skinwalker, uh, the red lights, small reds, and small blues would have a tendency to lure like three dogs off into the woods, and the owner would follow them and would find uh, three melted dog puddles. So the red and the blue, at least at Skinwalker, tendency to be pretty bad dudes. And speaking of that, <laughs> Unusual horse and cattle. This is a very recent photo of where a, a herd of cattle broke through the fence, broke through a tubular steel corral, knocked down a couple of tubular steel gates held together by a logging chain. And uh, they had been doing this uh, sometimes three nights in a row, sometimes one time, sometimes twice a week. And it was a very calm herd of cattle. And suddenly, they started displaying great fear, a lot of angst. They were very, very anxious. And uh, it got to a point where the owner couldn't even approach his own cattle. They wouldn't let him near them. And the final event came after, this was after a period of maybe two months. In daylight, he was standing just uh, uh, north of the old cabin, watching the herd. The whole herd was down in one field, nice, bright, clear day. And all of a sudden, it seems something is collecting the herd of cattle into a very tight pack, and then driving the entire herd into a corner of the field, tightly into a barbed wire fence corner and it held them there for quite a long period of time, and he could see nothing around, above, in, uh, that was doing this. Again, back to Skinwalker, in daylight, the uh, owner, his wife, and son watched as an invisible something separated an entire herd as it was walking through the middle of the herd, part of the herd going this way, part this way. Again, these cattle were extremely fearful. And all they had was a compass, but they could follow where this invisible thing was with a compass needle. And this happened a number of times. And occasionally, they would even get a, an image. If you've ever seen the movie uh, Predator, that's what they could see. Not a definite shape, not a, a solid something, but that. And. Uh, so I don't know. But he uh, eventually, uh, after about two months, tried to load the cattle up uh, to haul them to the uh, sale barn because, I mean, they were worthless. He couldn't do anything with them. And they could hardly get them into the, uh, into the uh, haulers. And once inside the haulers, they were just tearing the things to pieces. They got them to the sale barn, same thing, so you can imagine what kind of sale that was. And, but he had to get rid of an entire herd of cattle. And the good point for us is he now has a new herd. And so we're quite anxious to monitor what kind of and how fast changes start occurring with that herd. And we have cameras set up where hopefully, if it's visible, we'll be able to get it, put it that way. Uh, now the... Uh, <clears throat> I shouldn't say you'll like this story, but it's, uh, he had a prize, the same rancher had a prize horse, very gentle animal, he rode him every day, and as usual, he drove on to this very locked property, and he drove up to the corral, and the horse is standing there, normal, nothing different, and he got out, he talked to the horse, petted it, got back in the truck, drove to another section of the ranch, 
Fifteen minutes later, he drove back up to the corral. No horse. Part of the tubular steel corral was busted outward, and he looked up toward this old wooden barn and noticed that the two big heavy wooden doors had been beat up and pushed in. And so he walks into the barn and he found his horse. And what he found was horse pieces and blood, all the walls, the floor, 15 minutes. And he even made the, the statement, he said it was like the animal had exploded. And if you're familiar with this field, you know of a couple of things that could do that without ever touching uh, the animal. So it's not only interesting stuff, it's a little uh, worrying in some ways um, what, what these things might be up to, what they, and what reason, why do they pick on cattle? At this ranch, there have been almost countless mutilations. <clears throat> and the owner won't really talk about them. Now, he's at a point now where he will let us know when they happen so we can do DNA and looking for just samples uh, for anything. And uh, what normally would happen is he would uh, leave a cow, typically a calf, uh, go home for the night, lock the ranch all up, impossible for anyone to drive in there. And he would come back the next morning, the calf, nothing would be left except the skeleton. No fleshy material on the inside or outside of the, of the calf. And within five, six feet of it would be a 10 foot seared ring in the ground. And this repeated over and over and over. And on one occasion, he was riding this prize horse, obviously before the barn thing, uh, and the horse almost threw him off. He got off to see if it was a snake or something, and he found two 10-foot burnt rings uh, that the animal wouldn't approach. And we had the same thing happen with 166 head of cattle on site one, where a 10-foot ring was found following the night before bright white objects in the area. Uh, and the ring was swirled, tightly compressed to the ground. The central area was actually pulled up slightly. Uh, I've seen countless numbers of those kind of sites, and it's a very typical UFO site. And uh, two weeks later, he was trying to drive the cattle up the, uh, the chute, which is two barbed wire fences, 13 feet apart, connects different fields. And the ring uh, somehow was created inside that 13-foot chute. On the east side, there was a space between the edge of the ring and the fence 18 inches wide. The other section of the ring, there was a space six inches wide. As they're driving the cattle up uh, through the chute and they approach the ring, they go ballistic and they start falling backwards. They're just everything to get going the other way. And they start bending steel fence posts, breaking barbed wire, so they drive them back down to the end of the chute, let them calm down, start driving them through single file. And two weeks after the ring is found, 166 cattle go by this ring in this 18 inch wide path and not one set hoof on even the edge of that ring. We couldn't find anything unusual about the ring and we couldn't sense anything unusual, but obviously horses and cattle can. And in some instances, dogs are very good witnesses. Um, before I travel on, more proof that I am not the lone lunatic at Marley, uh, I'm gonna have Adam Johnson come up and describe an event that he and Tom had while I was just three, 400 feet down over a hill from him and I didn't get to see it. Damsky. Uh, basically, as Ted said, he likes to send me and Tom into the woods. <laughs> and uh, a couple months back, a very, very chilly night, probably five degrees. Um, I can remember that, believe me. Uh, we um, basically on site two of the Marley Woods, um, 
we kind of decided to go out and set up a little base camp in this tree stand that was below a ridge, which was probably about maybe um, a football field distance away from where Ted was up atop of a hill. And basically, um, Ted was observing stuff up there and everything above us, so we had that vantage point covered. And basically, me, me and Tom were in the tree stand uh, covering east and west down in this field where they've had lots of observations of light balls and, you know, the little white light uh, uh, orbs or balls of light that they have there. And basically, um, after, I'd say, a good three hours of freezing, <laughs> me and Tom were in the middle of the discussion, and he was covering east, and I was covering west past him. And um, basically, just out of nowhere, there was a bright uh, light that just came through not at, not at the top of the hill, but somewhere at the top of the trees, angled downward, was a beam of light. And at first, my first reaction was, oh, Ted's leaving. I guess he's, you know, driving with his car, going back, going to bed. Hey, <laughs> and, uh, <hey. laughs> and so we walkied, uh, walkie-talkied, you know, to Ted and said, uh, so are you heading, heading back? And he said, no, I'm right here. We said, well, do you have your headlights on? Nope. So that right then and there basically, you know, proved to us that it was impossible for anything to be, to be between us. I mean, it was impossible to be in, you know, anybody to be there between us, especially with the, the uh, size of the light that cast it on the, on the field. And uh, from Ted's position, you didn't have any observation of this at all, but me and Tom did. And uh, this pr probably lasted I'd say a good maybe 45 seconds or so, and uh, kind of scanned the field a little bit, and then it came to a stop. And you know that's when we walkie-talkied and everything. We we're kind of discussing this, and then it just went out. And um, after it went out, I'd say probably within the next minute or so, I kind of observed back there. Uh, peripheral vision caught um, one of the kind of one of the light light balls, a very faint glow of it, and then that just basically went out just like the light. And that was all that we had that night. But that's pretty much some of the strange stuff that goes on there. And like Ted said, a lot of the objects uh, really don't cast a lot of light. But it seems like in some instances, maybe when it wants to catch your attention, uh, you know, or play tricks with you, it, it maybe, I guess, likes to cast this light out and, you know, try to catch your attention and yeah. see how you react. I might just add the following morning, Adam and I went oh, out yeah. and tried to recreate the scene <coughs> and we went to the deer stand, went back, went out into the field where this, the light swept in front of us and came up to there and there was a light snow on the ground that morning and we ex went up to the angle where Ted's observation point was and there was no possible way that where he was, his location could have possibly his lights come down in that area. I mean, he would he would have had to drive another couple hundred feet and then basically jump a little drainage lagoon <laughs> and point park down into this field area. So there's no way possible. And what we've seen that night was just incredible. I mean, it was just swept and like Adam said, it was out. And just as it was working its way on up in our direction, it just blinked out like that. So. Uh, we ruled Ted out completely. <laughs> ah, I'm innocent on that one. Yep. Uh, tell them about the uh, seven ambers you guys saw. Oh, yeah. Saw. Um, this is from a different perspective. I mean, this. Yeah. Well, actually, that was back in, uh, let's see, May 3rd. Yeah, May 3rd last year. And uh, me and my two brothers and four of the owners at Site 1 um, from the observatory, um, I think it was about 722. Um, I set up shop and everything like I'm a video production major so I got everything set up early and stuff before dinner and made sure everything was going and uh, when it started going down I skipped out on the rest of dinner and went down there and got recording everything and made sure everything was running fine and so basically um, after about a half hour uh, uh, one of the owners screamed out there it is there it is and um, so then that's when the observation started of the ambers. And that was the first time I've really seen anything that I could not 
fully explain. Like I've seen the mystery light and stuff, but at first, you know, seeing that, um, you know, you, you kind of think, oh, you know, that could be something else, or you're not really sure about it until you look at it frame by frame, video wise. But so this was the live event for me was really, really just one of those events that just knocks you on your feet. And if you ever want to see the video, I don't think we have capabilities to show it right now, but it's on YouTube and it's also on our website, ufophysical.com. Um, basically, there are, as Ted described earlier, seven objects, and the objects come on. There's one of them that comes on initially, and we have to shift our camera because our camera is initially focused on the mystery light's location because that's what I've previously seen and was set up to image. And Basically, as it came on, I had to basically pan my camera over, and I had to steady it and everything, and I just let it run. And you basically saw, as I said, one object come on, and then it goes out, and then you had another object, another object, and then another object underneath it. And this is all within, you know, a matter of 20 seconds of each other. I mean, it's pretty simultaneous. And to wrap it all up, then you had a couple more. One came on after these ones, after this little arrangement shut off. Another one came on, and then I believe another one came on. And, you know, that really just, <laughs> it's hard to explain. But that's pretty much the stuff. And yeah, I'd check it out online. Thanks, Ben. Yep. Yeah, and a great job of, uh, of videoing that stuff. Uh, the cool thing is, the video runs, I don't know, a minute and 20 or so seconds. And these guys are professional videographers. And all you can hear is each one of these things appears is, wow. <laughs> and the wows get louder and more pronounced. But uh, uh, before we get to the National Enquirer section of this, um, I'll tell you a, a couple of the new things that have st has started happening in Marley. Very, very interesting stuff. And significant because, again, you're falling back to the Skinwalker Ranch stuff. And what that whole event has done, or series of events, uh, it has given us a baseline to work from at Marley Woods. And... Uh, very significant and extremely strange stuff uh, at, at Skinwalker. And on October the 3rd of last year, the Site 1 property owners, uh, the couple, are sitting out on the deck of their uh, observatory building. And out front, there is um, a series of fields that go to the north going down in elevation, and then ending in a low tree line, very high timber area from there on. And all of a sudden, coming from the ground, the, uh, in the close field, they see a small, intense red ball of light ascend from the ground. It comes up like this, lays over in a semi-horizontal trajectory, and they can see it for about 2,200 feet before it disappears behind very dense trees. Uh, as it disappears behind the trees, out of the corner of their eye, they see a second identical ball come off the ground at the same spot, and it follows basically the same trajectory. And that one <clears throat> is followed by six more, one at a time, totally silent, and believe me out there, you could drop a pin down in the field and probably hear it. It's uh, extremely remote and very quiet. And so eight of these things come off the ground and fly away. And of great interest is, about a week later, in the same line of sight in the field, they're sitting out there and a bright circular thing lights up. It's actually quite similar to the light mass, except equally divided down the middle. The west side is a bright red, 
the east side is a bright orange. And <clears throat> this thing is shimmering, extremely brilliant, goes on for a number of seconds, winks out. And I was put in contact with a science professor uh, outside the area who is a, also a, a professional pilot. And he was flying his light uh, aircraft, he and his wife, back to a small airport. It is a commercial airport. And they land, and they're in the process of readying the plane to be pushed back into the hangar when his wife looks up, and at the far end of the runway, she said, what are those? Two little balls of light, side by side, separated by perhaps three feet, size of headlights, about the brightness of headlights, are coming almost down on the runway, right down the runway. So they watch as these things come down, get closer, and pass directly by them at a distance of about 100 feet, and the instant they pass this spot, they can no longer see them. They can be seen from the front, but not from the side again. And so these are, are really extremely credible people who didn't believe in UFOs or flying objects. And the uh, owner of the, uh, of the ranch, where all the mutilations and bad stuff goes, uh, about five weeks ago, he and his wife saw a large white object to the east of their farmhouse, almost on the ground, and they watch it 10 minutes, 12 minutes, and suddenly it ascends vertically and becomes stationary. Then it moves this way and this way and down, and up and down, they said like a yo-yo. And uh, it's interesting when you have a growing pattern of the same type of maneuvers and motions. Uh, so this stuff goes on and on. Um, and you're soon here to hear a, uh, an event that took place just nine days ago. So it is constantly going on. That's another shot of part of the, uh, the cattle damage. As if things weren't strange enough, one morning the uh, uh, south property owner was out tending his cattle. The cattle were down in this field. And suddenly he sees two very large white animals walking along sort of side by side, very casually. And uh, he estimated that they would have weighed two to 300 pounds. And <clears throat> I have a 150-pound old English sheepdog, so I thought I knew what big dogs were. Uh, but you go to that point, you're talking about big dog. So fearing that these things, which he had never seen or heard of before, might kill one of his cattle, out of his truck, he pulls a high-powered rifle, and uh, he shoots one of them in the, uh, in the front shoulder. And he said, I made it red, meaning he could see blood. However, neither of the animals reacted to the shot, nor the animal he hit to the impact of the bullet. And they casually continued walking off and went over a six-foot barbed wire fence. Back to Skinwalker. At Skinwalker, the family there start one day, the, uh, the husband, his wife, and son are standing outside, snowy ground, and casually walking up from the woods is what he estimated to be a three to four hundred pound wolf-like animal. And it walks right up to him, and they're just about on eye level. Now, this is a big dude because... The guy it's looking at is like six foot four or five. And uh, he has this, as he looks in the eyes, I mean, they locked eyes. And as he looks into the eyes of this animal, he's overcome with 
total calm. Everything's fine. Typically, if you or I had something like that walk up, we'd be screaming going the other way, and I'd be yelling Tom and Adam to get it. <laughs> but we need a specimen. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so he actually feels like, boy, this is great. This is really friendly. In a split second, it's behind him with the head of a cow in its mouth working severely on the cow's head. And so he yells to his son to go get his pistol. So the son brings him a 357 Magnum. If you know anything about guns, you know they carry a pretty good wallop. He stuck the 357 in the side, pushed it into the side of this thing, and shot it three times. No reaction to the shots, no reaction to an impact, no blood. The thing turns loose of the, uh, of the head, turns around, casually walks off down the field. So the, the guy and his son follow it, and it's leaving a lot of tracks as it goes down. It goes into a wooded area, they follow it through there. It goes out into a field. Tracks are clearly visible, and at a point 30 feet out into the field, the tracks stop. No going this way, no going this way, no coming back. So that's kind of interesting stuff. <laughs> and uh, on another occasion, his wife was driving their car into the ranch. Again, this is semi-daylight, and uh, she stops the car to call her husband on the cell phone. And as she looks out the uh, driver's side window, she sees some legs and a body. Well, the big guy is back, he's standing right alongside the car, and he had to drop his head to look in the window. And if that picture wouldn't ruin your day. <laughs> <clears throat> so anyway, that's what was happening at Skinwalker. And so when we heard about uh, these two guys and a uh, high-powered rifle not dropping them dead, we started get it in, getting interested, and believe me, I swear, Scout's honor, we don't chase weird animals. That's not the sort of stuff that we do. But we don't turn away when something weird <laughs> comes along. And uh, so the next day, after he shoots and he sees him, his daughter owns an adjacent ranch. And she's out tending to something. And she sees the two large white animals walk by, no limp, no blood, no wound, no damage. And as a matter of fact, she told, told him, you know, they didn't seem to be injured at all, seemed to be fine. So then, <laughs> about 4,000 feet north on site one, uh, the property owner found some large clumps of white hair and a couple of barbed wire fences. And, um, as time went on, over the remaining months of 2008, they found more and more of these clumps of hair. And we keep thinking, why can't we find a track? Why can't we get a picture, something? And finally, after gathering up a number of these samples, I found a sample far north on the ranch and the strands of hair were 16 inches long. Now that's pretty long hair. Old English sheepdog doesn't come close to that, I'll tell you. And that's when we really started getting very curious. Um, so we were contacted by a microbiologist at a very well-respected laboratory. So I sent three of the samples from three different locations and uh, he tells me the entire lab became so enthralled with this hair that everyone had it under microscopes and they were running all kinds of tests all over the lab and he said it's the most fun we've had at the lab in years <laughs> and he said please send more or find another one of these animals <laughs> but uh, the really interesting thing is that they could not match it to any known hair specimen 
uh, that they possessed or they had on record or whatever. And so uh, in about a week, we're going to try to get a second DNA uh, test. Uh, as a matter of fact, we know we're going to get it. Uh, and see if we can get two DNA confirmations of this being uh, not matchable. And so when you get to that point, you're, you're really becoming interested in this. Um, this is a microscopic view of a, uh, a dog hair and the hair of the unknown animal. Quite a bit of difference. This is 400 power view, view of the unknown specimen. And that's the uh, medulla at 400 power. And uh, to put it very simply, this large laboratory has never seen anything like it. So send in the inquirer. We're ready. <laughs> that's some of the 16 inch stuff. Now, I don't know of anything living in. Missouri, Kentucky, or Arkansas. And I've done a lot of cave exploring. I've never encountered anything approaching this. But it gets curiouser when a, uh, a small, small town radio uh, newsman comes into work one morning and he makes the mistake of talking about this on the air. He said as he was driving to work that morning, he saw the biggest white animal that he had ever seen. And he was not at all aware of any of this because we had not talked about it and uh, it had not gotten out. And uh, he said, when I first saw it at a distance, my only thought was that this had to be some really enormous dog or wolf. That was until it stood up on its back feet and stood there. And he said, at that point, he said, I know this sounds crazy, but the only thing I could think of that size and that mass would be a polar bear. Well, we know there ain't no polar bear living <laughs> in this area. But <clears throat> so uh, it just goes on, you know, and we were gathering more and more eyewitnesses of high credibility. And then lo and behold, what do we find? A series of tracks. The property owner and the caretaker found these tracks after a heavy rain. And, we, and they were found in two areas about 500 feet apart. One near a big pond spillway where there's always a lot of good drinking water. And some of these were very, very uh, evident prints. And they measure uh, five inches long, five inches long, uh, wide. And uh, at the end, in some of those, you can see at the end, uh, claw marks, claw imprints, the size of my little finger. It's not a very big finger, but it's a big claw. And uh, so we did plaster casts, we photographed. And I know some animals, when they walk, a four-legged animal can walk in such a way that it leaves the appearance of a two-legged trail. So as I'm standing there looking at this 27 foot of, of tracks, um, I asked the owner to go up to the other end. I said, look, look down through there. And what do you see? He said, this thing wasn't four legs. And so then we start talking, and I've talked to Tom and Adam, and anybody that would listen, not threaten me, uh, about the possibility, okay, you know, but the animals that can leave what appear to be two-legged tracks uh, don't leave tracks like these at all. They're totally different. And I can't even remember Tom found some that could leave those kind of, of tracks. Uh, and they're not typically found at uh, an area like Marley. But another curious thing about this, this is uh, the top one of, the, uh, of one of the imprints. But this is a really good part. You'll notice over towards the ruler, that hump there is the back pad, which is a pretty massive pad. 
and it has gone an inch and a half into the ground. And I could take the heel of my shoe and I could get maybe a quarter of an inch. And of course, obviously, you know, I'm under 150 pounds or something like that. But <clears throat> it, uh, and so I start watching my sheepdog, you know, and she's a little uneasy uh, the way I trail her around, make her put footprints and stuff. And I think she, she believes I'm sizing her up for a burial box or something. And, <clears throat> but believe me, her tracks, 150 pound dog, wouldn't begin to go into the ground a half an inch. And her tracks are about two inches in size. Here we're talking about five inches. It's a big foot. That's a big foot. No pun intended. Uh, we did have one Bigfoot sighting just outside of Marley. And uh, Tom and the guys looked into it a little bit. And we know the witness. Why not? I mean, you know, we've got, we've got everything else going on there. But uh, this is truly a fascinating thing. Now the real good part is that, uh, no, we haven't found any dropping, so I haven't b been able to test any of those. And you can always tell by taste on the droppings, you know. <laughs> Tom and Adam have actually developed a taste for that, so we... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, about seven, eight days ago, nights ago. The uh, Site 1 property owner and his wife were sitting on the observatory deck at 12.30, midnight, 30. And coming up out of the north field, they see two huge white animals. And they walk up to a fence about 30 feet in front of them. And there were lights on in the, uh, on the first floor of the building which illuminated that fence. And they could see them quite clearly. Uh, long white hair. And they were standing at the fence. And of all things, the property owners have a Jack Russell. And if you've ever had a Jack Russell, you know where this is going. <laughs> the Jack Russell is a little bitty dog. But man, they think they can take on anything. And usually they can. I mean, they're pretty frightening little dudes. So from behind the observatory, they hear the, the barking of a Jack Russell on full blower, comes out from in front of the building, and they're probably thinking, you know, oh my God, there goes Jack Russell. <laughs> and he suddenly skids to a stop about 20 feet from him, and he lays down flat. I've never seen a Jack Russell do that. So Jack was sensing something. And the property owner jumped up from his chair. And when he did this, the chair scooted, made a noise. And the two animals looked directly at him. And this is a no-nonsense guy. And I would believe this man in any story he'd tell me. And he said, Ted, I don't want to make something out of this. But he said, I have never seen a face like these two things had. And finally, they turn around and they calmly walk off into the darkness again. And the bright light is that we had a CCD video unit right on that spot recording. So we'll be going over there uh, probably this weekend, Sunday. And uh, I'm hoping because it would really be extraordinary to be able to, to see this whole event uh, live with motion. And uh, then the very latest thing, two days ago, a, a radio personality in a fairly large town north of here went on the, uh, on the air and said, it kind of in jest, you guys are not going to believe what I saw on the way to work this morning. And she said, I saw the biggest white dog or wolf that I've ever seen. 
And she kept saying, the thing that scared the devil out of me was the face. Not a dog face, not a wolf face. So keep your fingers crossed, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, be posting that video on our website. So if we're very, very lucky, that'll be interesting. At least maybe we'll find out it may be uh, a cocker spaniel. I don't know. <laughs> but so anyway, that's a, a kind of a brief trip through the Marley Woods, and I really appreciate uh, your listening. Thank you very much.